So one of the first things I want to really highlight as we take on this topic of convergence is that it is a coalition of the willing. People want to work together. People are drawn to this topic who, who have been impacted personally by the suffering that has occurred from these disasters and want to do something to make a difference. And so we might notice all the difference. A practitioner doesn't get their research or the researcher doesn't get the practice or we don't have access or we see a lot of the challenges. I want to just start and kind of give a foundation to our panel. Uh, and I believe all these panelists embody this as well that is a coalition of the willing, that we want to come together and we want to figure this out. There is not a divisive person that's trying to make it not work. Uh, it's just finding systems that, that make it work. So part of what makes it work is the diversity, is having a cross-discipline, not just, so my community of practice is emergency management, homeland security, academic programs. But we need to work way beyond that. And I'm sure as you've been discussing over the past couple of days, you've been highlighting all the different academic disciplines that need to converge in order for us to solve the wicked problems that are hitting us. And when these disasters occur, we think that we knew what the wicked problems are, then we realize there are far more wicked problems ahead of us. And how do we facilitate the decision making that needs to happen? How do we create a construct for this convergence. And I think our panelists are going to inform us of some ideas they have, some successes that they have had, and some additional challenges that all of us working together are going to help facilitate. So without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our panelists. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce everybody and then turn it over to Bill and Bill you. And I think, are we the first panel to use PowerPoint? No? Yes? Maybe? There's been some, well, all of us are, but we're gonna use it very well. I know, I thought here, the government panel goes, everybody use a PowerPoint. <laughs> but I think that on the last day and when we're hearing some of these ideas to have some of the visuals to, to help us, so I'll be getting up and down and switching over. Um, you have in the app, which is a, a beautiful app, I think the orchestration of this gathering has been really good both virtually and in person. And so you'll see uh, full on bios of all of them. We had a coordinating call where we got to talk to each other about about how do we want to approach this panel. So I have some highlights just of my impressions of what I think of each of these individuals and of most of them I've just met during this panel so I feel very grateful for that. And then Trisha I've known for a while. Uh, but Bill, he came on the call and you know when you're on a call, you're like oh, just kind of feeling it out. Bill comes on so strong. He is so passionate about what he's doing and he comes with such incredible history and background. So half of his career, he said, half of my career I was working as a research scientist, half I was working as a college administrator and a community activist. And that's what you're going to hear. Activist is in his heart. He doesn't feel himself separate. Each one of these people you'll see, and in Bill, I really heard it full on. He is convergence. He's convergence of an administrator, of an activist, of a researcher in one body. He was there for Superstorm Sandy. It impacted him. He saw the devastation. He saw the possibility of what he's learned and how it could help the community that he lived within. And he did something about it. He's doing something about it. And he wants to encourage all the research scientists here to be a part of their community and be a part of the solutions that are impacting their community and to get tenure credit for it too and to be able to be uh, have freedom to work across the interdisciplinary so i'm really excited that you're here with us i know i'm hopefully i don't take too long but i'm a huge fan of all these people now so mark martin is sitting next to him and he is from puerto rico from viecas i practiced really hard must have said it like 50 different times viecas love and what Mark has been bringing to the table is he is a bridger, a connector uh, of government stakeholders, of community stakeholders, of academic, both teaching and research, and how can we, again, bring that to the community level. Convergence that happens up here might be important. We want to converge laterally, but a holistic convergence is what is needed, and I think that you've achieved that and are gonna share more about your efforts here. Uh, Trisha Wachendorf has been, uh, 
known her since I started this job and just incredibly impressed by her. Uh, she is a sociologist, a teacher, and a researcher. She's researched uh, from 9-11 to various tsunamis. She's been in there looking at it. Most recently, she's looking at families, at household preparedness, and how, how do we make decisions for our households, and how does that work? She's going to share with us a, a new thing called DRC it. I won't, I won't burst her bubble, but I'm incredibly excited about making research accessible. And the DRC, the Disaster Research Center at the University of Delaware, is doing that and, and is an exemplar. Last but not least, <laughs> Stephen Wall. And Stephen cares about research getting to practice, too. He a, has a background in the energy sector and has been working on the response and recovery of trying to get energy actually operational pre, post, all phases, making sure that things work. I think the thing that's really interesting to him is that he, he again, you'll hear this theme, caring about communities. It's not good enough to have something work in a lab. It has to be in the community. It has to be accessible. And it has to be delivered in a way that's not threatening, that isn't like, here we came to save the day, my cape of knowing what to do. But how does what we know work with what you know to make it all work so it actually makes a change in our environment that's more resilient. So the, again, these are my impressions. You can read this and anything that I left off, they're gonna fill in too. And so I'm gonna turn it over to you, Bill. You have a mic in your chair too. Good morning, and uh, thank you, Wendy. Uh, I, I guess one of the advantages of being late in the program is I'm going to try to build on themes and, and things that I've heard uh, uh, throughout the, this exciting uh, conference. Uh, I want to talk about resiliency and community planning following Superstorm Sandy with the storm surge that hit uh, Staten Island in 2012 with a significant loss of life. Many people were left homeless. Others were living for more than a year out of their cars, and in fact, some of the areas have never recovered, uh, even today, or are still in the process of recovery. Uh, when I was primarily a geoscientist involved with flooding and uh, mud flows around volcanoes, uh, I was amazed that as scientists we could predict hazards, but no one would listen. Later, when I found myself president of the College of Staten Island and Superstorm Sandy hit, I realized that I had a bully pulpit to speak out about the dangers of rising sea level, the need for education about natural processes to be sure that the public understands that we live on an active, ever-changing planet, and failure to uh, prepare for that change, which is now accelerated by human impact, is really to accept disaster. And I think we have to act now. Hurricanes, storm surges, coastal flooding are becoming a way of life. Uh, Cuando era Puerto Ricoño, uh, in mi corazón, Mayacuesano, <laughs> uh, hace casi 50 años, uh, hubo un dicho. Uh, there was a saying in the Caribbean, um, an old saying that said, June too soon, July stand by, August come they must, September remember, October all over. 50 years later, I think it's September remember, October remember, November, not out of the woods yet, December, maybe. And uh, that's really the changing world that we live in. So following Hurricane Irene in 2011 that impacted the New York area, uh, many New Yorkers thought that we could survive a hurricane. Uh, but the interdisciplinary team that I put together felt that we had dodged the proverbial bullet. And so we used the power of the high-performance uh, computing system at the College of Staten Island um, to model a hypothetical surge uh, that looked eerily like that of the subsequent actual storm of Sandy. And based on that work, I began advocating for a five-point plan to respond to rising uh, sea levels. First, we have to protect our dunes and marshes and wetlands and barriers. They're nature's buffers and nature's sponges, and we still have a lot of them left that need to be protected. We need to rebuild those features whenever possible. Uh, we need to rezone high-risk areas to recreational purposes, day-use areas. Uh, even within vulnerable areas, we found on uh, Staten Island that old marsh channels, for example, uh, were more vulnerable than other vulnerable areas. Uh, we need to consider appropriate use of seawalls and floodgates and other engineering solutions, but understanding that often engineering solutions protect one area at the expense of another area. 
Uh, and uh, most importantly, we need to educate uh, uh, people, climb to safety. The, the tragedy in Staten Island is, uh, is, is people were drowned because they ran down into their basements in, in behavior appropriate for a tornado, but not for a storm surge. Uh, central for our work was an understanding that we needed change to keep our community uh, safe. And so I, we put together an interdisciplinary team of geoscientists, computer scientists, economists, psychologists, nurses, social workers, mental health counselors, creative writers, and public health specialists all working together. And that to me is the exciting uh, part of uh, a community uh, activists. Uh, I was appointed to the governor's task force and we used uh, uh, regular presentations and speeches to um, advocate for uh, long-term uh, planning. One of my team members, Alan Benamoff, is uh, here in the front, who has done a long-time community show on Staten Island uh, cable TV called Geology Forum, something that I rarely see in, in other communities. And uh, we felt that this education was uh, uh, crucial. At the college, uh, you know, the role that I play as president is, is that our college is an anchor institution on Staten Island. Uh, we have a strategic priority of borough stewardship and a motto that we're a part of Staten Island, not a part from Staten Island. And uh, this, so we naturally took on that role of community uh, leadership. And, you know, environmental change requires a, a high degree of community activism. So when I uh, 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 served on Governor Cuomo's New York Rising uh, Communities Task Force on Staten Island, you know, in meetings, we often add 30 to 100 people in the room with competing interests and often contradictory interests, life support, rebuilding homes, small business recovery, emergency plans, property values, political long-term planning all competed for attention. You know, on the surface, those community members seem not to care about scientific publications. But I would submit if we had not published in scientific papers, we wouldn't have had the credibility to be taken seriously. And so I think both things are needed. Scientists need to publish their work, but they also need to get involved in, in sharing that work. You can't have one without the other, without the, the traditional peer-reviewed scholarship, but it, the peer-reviewed scholarship is not enough to affect uh, change. And I think in, in my experience, uh, scientists are reluctant to get involved in community activism. And, but I argue that that's the only way to change uh, uh, public policy. I think for too long there's been a stigma in the scholarly community against uh, promoting scholarly ideas to the public. And I would argue that that's contrary to the common good. And we really need more scientists and more scholars uh, who are engaged in uh, promoting their work. And, you know, I think uh, Wendy mentioned earlier, we need to look at, uh, you know, reward faculty roles and rewards, uh, you know, to reward the scholarship of public advocacy and uh, writing in addition to that of basic research. Uh, they're, they're, they're both uh, very, very uh, important. Uh, scientific societies can play a powerful role as well. In my own uh, society, the Geological Society of America, and I'm not going to read the whole statement, but there's a public statement that says geoscientists have a professional responsibility to inform the public about natural hazards. And, and, and I think that that's something that uh, probably every scientific society could have uh, as, as a motto to copy. So on Staten Island in New York City, uh, in order to infect environment and policy change, scientists have to navigate a, an exceedingly complex political system. You know, on Staten Island, we have a city government with a mayor, a city council, a borough president. We have community boards. There's state government with the governor, the state, the assembly. There's the federal government with local congressmen and senators. There are federal agencies like the National Park Service and Army Corps of Engineers. There's regulatory agencies, uh, both New York City and New York State. Departments of Environmental Protection, sometimes at odd with each other, sometimes uh, uh, on the same page. There's New York City Parks, there's New York State, and New York City Office of Emergency Management. And I'm sure I've left a bunch out, but you get the picture. You know, dealing with coastal planning takes a lot of coordination and demands interdisciplinary teams. And 
while the agencies may vary, I'm sure every one of your communities has a similar uh, array of, of agencies that need to be worked with. Um, and I don't think you can do that work without uh, a team approach and having multiple team members and multiple uh, skills on that. Uh, you know, we've uh, long uh, advocated on our team for go to high ground uh, signage. Uh, one of the things that we added to it, we sort of copied this signage based on tsunami warnings from Puerto Rico and from, uh, from the West Coast, but the thing we added to it is to take your car with you. The real tragedy on Staten Island is we have a lot of high ground but people didn't know where to go. And uh, the tragedy is not only the uh, 23 people who were killed in the surge and the thousands to tens of thousands who were left uh, homeless, uh, many of those people lost their cars as well. And you know, unlike Puerto Rico, it, we had six inches of snow about three days following the storm uh, surge. And if people had just had their cars, they could have sheltered in the cars. And so we've come up with a transportation plan to try to take uh, cars to uh, safety. You know, and even when you think you've successfully uh, navigated uh, your work, there's still more to do. And if you see on the sign here, the left is uh, the sign before and after five years of hard work, we got the arrow turned 90 degrees. But turning that arrow 90 degrees will save lives because the old sign directed people parallel to the shore. And so again, there was loss of life with people running parallel to the shore as opposing turning 90 degrees and going where the high ground is. So it may seem trivial to change the direction of an arrow when you had a more elaborate plan in mind, but it will save lives and, it, and, and, and it's much better than what was there before. Uh, you know, my closing, I guess, uh, the science, technology, IT, and modeling tools alone cannot keep our community safe. You know, that takes uh, community activism. It takes legislation. It takes interdisciplinary teams from many different disciplines that includes the humanities and the social sciences all working together uh, with the, uh, the uh, long-range uh, planners and uh, the other team members like are here on the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Val. Bill, as I switch over to the slides, I want to ask you a question, Bill. Um, you talked, you gave us a whole list and litany of stakeholders and players that were involved in these sorts of changes of just moving a, a sign 90 degrees. One of the questions that we were asked to think about as a panel what were, what incentivizes people? Did you notice different things incentivize different stakeholders? Did you have to approach people differently in order to get some of the things done, whether it's that or other uh, remedies that you've been able to institute? Yeah, I think it's tough. I mean, grounded was the role that the, our college played as an anchor institution. And even before Superstorm Standy had branded ourselves as a place where we have serious conversations about difficult topics. And I can't think of anything more than a difficult topic when you put 100 people in the room, um, 30 of them who are homeless because they've lost their homes and are angry because relief isn't coming fast enough to rebuild the homes and you have other people in the same room who are looking 20, 30, 50, 60 years out trying to do the right thing and dealing with those competing interests was re it was both exciting and it was a, it, it was a real challenge. Mark? Hi, my name is Mark Martin Brass. I come from Vieques, uh, Vieques Love, an organization uh, that was born out of Maria and has morphed into uh, something else like many of us have. Uh, I first want to show you where Vieques is uh, in relation and uh, trust me when I say it's an uh, enchanting island that will capture you if you ever go with the brightest bioluminescent bay in the world and, and some great uh, interesting nature and complex history. It used to be a military base, a super fun site, uh, and it, it faces a lot of social challenges as well as infrastructure one. I want to show the next slide because we seem to forget with time the monster that Maria was and the way that it took away all sorts of services, all sorts of uh, uh, human interactions. Uh, I, I wish I could tell you that the reality is that everybody pulled together and showed their best side in unity. And I'm not talking about Vieques, I'm talking all, all these disaster areas I saw in Puerto Rico, but it wasn't the case. 
It was such a communal shock. It created such a communal psychological trauma that we still live that the functions that were set out, the structure that was uh, installed, did not work in many ways. And so we had a lot of people reinvent the wheel because we had to. <laughs> this is just to show you some of the things my organization had to work on. And really what happened is that we had a campaign, campaign manager for politicians, an oceanographer, a graphic designer. We had all these sorts of people spread out, but the reality in Vieques was that the system crashed. And so the emergency management that was trained and the leadership and even the federal government wasn't even there for a couple of weeks. So we looked around and we said, what can we do? Who do we have? We didn't have communications, all the things that you heard out that broke down. So we stood up. One thing we had was the support of the people who loved us. And we have forgotten to include in the conversation enough, I think, the philanthropic, the diaspora, the foundation, and the private influx that helped the, the response of Maria. Without them, we'd be even sadder. And it would have been a chaotic tragedy. And that's something positive that came out of Maria that created some connections that we have to include in this convergence. As we played around, we realized that we became more of a fielder. My organization had people that had gone to Vieques over 7,000 donors that donated up to a million dollars. So you know, what would we do? Oh, well, we'll go to the government. Eh, no, you can't do that. That's duality. Are you doing it? No. Okay. And we had to do the craziest things, buy fuel for municipalities, pay the pharmacy so it serves medicine for cancer patients. All these things that we can talk about in detail, but really not something that we want to do again or that we should have been doing. So we tried to come up with community solutions. And these community solutions really came from the people that had the need and many times the insight. Let's not make the mistake that, that nobody there knows better. Let's go show them how it is. Uh, but we did have the help. And I'm here partly uh, because of Mark Lichtenstein and, and the SUNY system who participated in Vieques with an ethical thinking of not saying, I'm going to go there and help and show you and give you stuff. It's like, what do you need? And we'll figure out if we could do it. That was the case with the ESF. That was the case with SUNY, Minnesota. Uh, the Columbia Urban Design Lab, they came down and said, what do you need? We'll design it. We'll try to help you. And just a quick note, like of all the structures, all the buildings they had, one of their solutions brought by people, architect girl that, that just graduated from Vieques, and one of the ladies from the Urban Design Lab was like, what can we come up for emergency management? What's a good thing? Oh, we need solar panels. We need to say, sure, we need all that. But you have horses and a lot of horse people. Let's develop the rangers, the Taino rangers that are going to go around and find people in the response when the, nobody can get through, and they could be connected. And we got in touch with William Patterson University and some of the other University of Puerto Rico and developed an uh, incredible system, one of the most sophisticated systems from ham radio and community radios. We have 62 community radio operators in Vieques. We have 10,000 people. <laughs> we have three stations. We have 30 ham radio. We have 11 satellite phones just in Vieques Love. Just created communications as we can. But we did it with the catalyst of the universities helping us. And we both learned. And that takes me to what I think is going to work if we're going to do convergence. And that's a virtuous exchange. It's a model that's taken by the Aspire approach. It's a model that researchers and uh, academia have to include a convener, a person, maybe me humbly, but I may be a, many other people, that is not government, that is not particularly, it could be definitely in the community group and in the NGO sector more often than not. And this person will help those researchers get better science. They will get a higher efficiency into whatever federal program is going, not only by education, but identifying in a flexible way the gaps that are there and the sensitivity of the place that can make the solutions. We did all these things, but after we got partners or the government came in, we stepped out. And that's going to have to go into any model that we design here so that we go through a process and we're able to uh, uh, kind of spin and pivot. And that pivoting is not as easy for federal agencies as it is for the convener. 
That virtuous exchange is a connection between the information they need for research and the reality of what's happening in the place, but a product that helps us both. When we came along, we just didn't have the experience. If we would have had the product that can come out of the rice in terms of guidelines, processes, digital tools, and the connection avenues for the academia to us, wow. I dare say there might have been people still alive. Mark Lichtenstein and Cara, you know, talked a lot about something that's very important. I heard a lot of people say, and it inspires me from this group, and that is the human experience brought into academia and research. I am usually a scientist in oceanography, so I know that they take away for objectivity understanding. But in this case, you cannot. You'll fail. You won't tap into what you need to tap into. And in that system, a lot of us were completely you know, people, Mark said very nicely, hey, you, you might have saved lives. Yeah, I'm an ocean over community leader guy. But anybody who's in the business of saving lives can tell you, you're going to cost lives. And that's something really hard to live with. The mental health support and all these other things supports that you can help bring, not only by bringing it, I think we have to stop bringing it and saying like catalyzing, promoting, fostering, planting, combining, because you'll learn a lot too. It's a virtuous exchange of what the reality of the modern world is now and how that can be. I wanted to, for the, the human experience. These two girls will never forget meeting each other. At the higher education level, that has happened as well. So how we look forward, one of the things we have to see is that there is a lot of components and Rice has a way that it can academically organize them. And I think that coming up with a matrix and a network may be something we'll talk about a little bit more. But I really want you to know that there is a thing that nature and youth is doing in terms of climate change, in terms of disaster management, in terms of how we live that should inspire us to be more bold, dare to be radical, or you just watch the world, eloquently watch the world crumbling around you. We have to change the processes for things that are realistic, achievable, but, but radical enough, because it doesn't work. And so you sit in these conferences and you say, hey, you know, uh, th well, this is invented. Oh, we have this process. Oh, look at this. We know we all need that. It is the peer review. It is the exact science that will lead us to where we need to do. But don't fall into the mistake of the side effects of that, which just takes you to the, oh, why doesn't it work? Or, or why is there ego in the way? Or why is all these other things preventing it from being executed? One of the strongest things that I think we should do is educate. I started, and I was shut down harshly by the gentleman from CUNY, but that's all right. I think I used the word mandatory when I said that every single human that goes through an education system, and I appreciate the uh, Belez Arrocho who said something similar, that goes through a system of education that includes elementary, high school, and university, how is it that it's not coming out prepared in life-saving or survival situations? How is it that they don't teach first aid prepared? It takes one day of those 16 years, but realistically eight, because they have to be somewhat adults for that. How is it that a third certification, which takes three days, is not mandatory in that system? And I think one of it is that we are losing the reality of what is valuable in terms of education and what is the reality of what's happening now. But Maria, for us, and Sandy, and Katrina, and the fires, and the all these other things that are happening, the, the, the gentleman from Japan dealing with a different situation, do one thing. They take the awareness, they take all that, and they rip it out of you because you are seeing real. And within that real, there is opportunity to converge and find systems of convergence that allow us to think differently and to remember that we have to look at the world that we have right now as something that is not what we were all trained to do. So how do we apply? And again, there to be bold, there to be radical, because we need it. Thank you. Thank you.
So good morning. Um, I want to start off by thanking Eric for organizing this panel and for Wendy for taking such a, a strong lead in corralling us together and, and helping guide some of the questions and the discussion. And I also want to thank you this morning for your comment on the, your, your reference to the coalition of the willing. And if you're tweeting at all, I think that's a pretty good hashtag to throw up on the Rise uh, 2019 uh, Twitter account. Um, because I think that's really important to highlight and it's something that, that resonates with me, uh, my work at the Disaster Research Center and the fabulous colleagues that uh, I have an opportunity to work with through that center that we see ourselves as part of that coalition of, of the willing. Um, our center has been doing work in the disaster domain since 1963, uh, starting off very much in a disciplinary domain but moving into this uh, broader interdisciplinary field and interaction and an and, and intellectual home, really, that we find ourselves in. All of our faculty members have um, tenured or tenure track homes in uh, traditional departments like sociology or geography or public policy or civil engineering or public health. Uh, but we come to DRC because this is important to us. It's an intellectual home, it's a mechanism for us to engage in conversations with each other. No one is demanding us to do it. It's not part of our um, faculty requirements, but it's important. And that's been modeled to us by the faculty who we've worked with, the students we engage with, and that coalition of the willing, I think, is really a, a good descriptor for all of the people in the room here today, that there's not a a resistance or a lack of interest in doing this kind of work, but a continuous uh, struggle, a continuous pull to think about how we, what we've done, how that has worked, and what we can do better. Um, and I hope to talk a little bit about some of the examples that we've done at the Disaster Research Center just to get us started uh, today and, and look forward to some of the discussion in the, the question and answer period as well. I want to start off by really emphasizing the value of research, of basic science research. And I want to make certain that that is not lost in this discussion. That doesn't necessarily mean public publishing in the most obscure academic journals. I know that my work that's interdisciplinary won't be accepted in most of those journals. Um, but it's still acknowledging the value of bringing in the theories, the concepts, the rigorous methodologies in tackling these important issues, in giving value to that work, and creating a space and fostering a space for that interdisciplinary work to reach both the community, some of the examples that we talked about, to reach policy and decision makers, and to reach other researchers and scholars who are diving into this field, who've done so for many years or who are doing so for the first time. Examples of that include the Handbook of Disaster Research. For those of you here at SUNY Albany, you'll recognize one of the co-authors as your president on that, but also um, current faculty member and former student of the Disaster Research Center. Other work that is a compilation of interdisciplinary scholars, often co-authoring pieces, and also people coming from the practitioner side, the applied side, to work on those articles and contribute their knowledge in those fields as well. It includes um, very high profile work, like one of our new faculty members focusing on retreat, managed retreat, climate adaptation, cutting edge interdisciplinary research, showing up in science, and it also includes the very difficult, very challenging, long-term work of the kind that I was involved in with uh, colleagues at the Disaster Research Center, as well as civil engineers and atmospheric scientists from around the country, tackling issues related to evacuation behavior, pulling together these different approaches, sometimes not knowing what the person on the phone call is actually saying, uh, but having the patience with each other, to, to trust that they have expertise in this area, to devote the time that it takes to really understand those questions, to develop those trusted, sustained relationships with each other, 
to engage, for example, as we did with the, the project on the, on the evacuation modeling, with stakeholders in state emergency management, in the federal emergency management agency, at the regional level, with the American Red Cross, meeting with them every year, twice a year, once on the phone, once in person, to get their input. Is what we're doing applicable? Is, is what we're doing useful to you? What input do you have? But also as we're deploying in the field to North Carolina, something that might not make it in a, in a journal publication like this, but we can say, we were in the shelters and this is what we saw. We were talking to people three months ago and we want to give you this information. It might not make its way into a publication, but is useful for you nonetheless. And they can take that that discussion, that informal conversation, and immediately integrate it into their practice. That you can do both of those, engage with practitioners, engage with each other, and value that, that basic science research and the contribution it makes over time. But there's other work that we're doing as well. Um, and again, I'm highlighting some of the, not just my work, but the work of my, my colleagues and the students and faculty associated with the Disaster Research Center. Um, the very complex system dynamic model that you see here uh, was developed uh, looking at initially at a concept of resilience, moving a little bit away from that to look at uh, post-disaster recovery trajectories and community well-being. A very detailed systems dynamic model developed with medical scientists, um, civil engineers, social scientists, grounding that in the literature, trying to figure out a new way of conceptualizing and understanding uh, theoretically, but also a way to, to compare communities across the country. Um, but this model had a lot of shortcomings to it. One of the things is it relied on county level data um, because that's something that is consistent that the researchers could look at. But when we talked to one of our um, partners who's just right over the border from Delaware and Pennsylvania, Chester County, uh, if you go to Chester County, you can't look at county level data. It's some of the most uh, expensive homes in, in the country, uh, but also some of the most challenging neighborhoods um, that you can find. And so looking at county level data does not capture that. Understanding that issue and working with them that they can use this as a conceptual model, even if they can't plug in the numbers, and then developing rubrics that are meaningful for them. What are some of the questions that you can start finding out from those neighborhoods um, in your community groups, in your town halls, to help you make sense of those factors in a, in a more detailed way, and using that information to better improve the model itself. That relationship, having that, that advantage working in both directions. We are fortunate enough to have um, the EL Quarantelli Resource Collection. Uh, this, in addition to, to holding archives from the past 50 years of research conducted at the center and from scholars around the world, um, we also have over 125,000 items in our library. Uh, it's made use of by visiting scholars and practitioners who come to our center, uh, but we also have DISCAD, if you go to our website, uh, an, a mechanism that you can search that collection uh, and find out material, and maybe that's one-of-a-kind material that's available only at our center, maybe it's something that's available elsewhere, but making that collection as accessible as possible for people who are experts in the area, for communities, for um, decision makers, as well as for new scholars in the area is an important bridge that we try to aim for. Um, two more examples for you. Uh, I had the, the fortunate uh, experience of leading a Delaware Teachers Institute uh, course. This was developed through uh, Yale Teachers Institute, and Delaware has a model of it. We were really interested in impacting K through 12 education, developing modules that could be used in multiple age groups over time, reinforcing that information, um, really bringing the science into the classroom for children as young as kindergarten. Um, I am not a kindergarten teacher or an eighth grade teacher or a 12th grade teacher. Um, rather than trying to do that ourselves, we partnered and we brought in, uh, in conjunction with this initiative, 
uh, teachers from public schools in Delaware. Uh, they were familiar with, became familiar with the science on disasters in a number of interdisciplinary ways and developed, like you see here, a module for a kindergarten to learn about geography but through hazards. Uh, doing that in chemistry and English throughout the, the elementary and, and uh, secondary education. A great way to sort of to, to begin to spark that interest, but also bring that knowledge uh, to the younger members of our society and communities. And then finally, I want to talk about DRC Ed. Thank you for the plug, Wendy. Um, this is something that we've also engaged students in. Uh, we had students at the graduate students at the Disaster Research Center tackle questions that we get inquiries on from the media, from community leaders, from emergency managers. We started with the idea of why don't people evacuate uh, for a hurricane. Uh, the students worked uh, exhaustively in scouring the literature. They developed a 10 to 15 page summary of that literature uh, for those who might be not interested in reading 12 to 15 pages, then there's a two to five page summary. If they don't want to read that, we developed a six to eight minute video condensing that information and an extensive bibliography. So that allows people to go in to tackle a question if they want to start with the video, if that's good enough, if they want to dive in deeper, they know where that research is coming from um, and trying to use that as a way to push that out, uh, not only to our community, but to get that seen as well. So I'm going to stop there. Um, and look forward to the discussion. Already, you can hear the convergence when we heard Mark talk about we need more uh, in the schools. And then we hear, Tricia, you provide us an example of something that's happening in the schools. And I think that's part of that information sharing that you highlighted in building the trust to do that. And Mark, I, the bold and the love, I think the love is one of the most bold things that we can do, that we can connect this and this, and that's really the fuel for convergence. So thank you. Let me do my job here and pull up the slides. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you. Uh, honestly, thank you, Cecilio. Thank you, Marla. Thank you for, to the other organizers, Eric and Wendy, for having us all here. It's a real privilege to be among such a group, an august group of scholars and practitioners. And it's even more of a privilege to be up here to share a few thoughts with you from, from the stage. Uh, I know not only a few of us get, get up here to do that, and I, I want to make the most of the time. Uh, I, and um, hopefully I have a couple useful things to say to you all. This is a word cloud from my notes from the past few days. So you can see the themes that, that jumped out to me. Resilience obviously being one, but community and community-directed outcomes, solid number two. I think that was probably the biggest theme that I heard talked about over and over again. You also see things like pedagogy, uh, action, service, problems, design. I think the breadth and depth of the problems that we've discussed here can't be solved in three days, but it gives me confidence and hope to see all of us together committed to try to solve some of these problems and do better the next time we, we face some of them. The next time we face some of them, hopefully we will have thought more about convergence. It's a difficult problem though, as we've all recognized in various ways, and even being here, I think we recognize is a recognition that convergence is a difficult problem to solve. These are just some of the relevant programs and actors and, and, and frameworks and definitions relevant to resilience. I mean, I think there's a dozen programs at each of these federal agencies that could be have funding relevant to resilience. And then these definitions are a little bit all over the place and someone, we, we need to do the work of figuring out what resilience means to rise and how we're gonna communicate that to the, to the people we want to reach. The question among all of these is, how do we distinguish between scope creep though and convergence? Because we often are warned at our federal jobs about scope creep. We have budget to do very specific things. 
uh, and anything outside of that, people start to get uncomfortable. Even if it's legal, people start to get uncomfortable. Getting creative and thinking outside of those silos is a challenge to all of us in the federal service, and hopefully one that you all can, that are practitioners, university students, et cetera, can help us work through, because we need that support in order to see change happen. As we do that, we think through about how the federal government can respond better. We also need to think about how do we make sure communities have a voice in that. The federal government works with states mostly. That is most of what we do. That's the way the Constitution is set up, and that is appropriate. But in doing so, we need to make sure that we are capturing voices within the state that aren't necessarily in the governor's office at that moment. And then we also have the question of how do we do this well? Because um, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth, in the words of the immortal Mike Tyson. Um, <laughs> and in 2017, I think that happens. If you count 2018, we had disaster events in every U.S. time zone. We had everything from hurricanes and typhoons, tornadoes, earthquakes, wildfires, volcanic eruptions. Um, there really wasn't anything that we didn't see in those two years. Uh, it was an uh, unprecedented amount of response that was necessary, and we saw how things worked well, and we also saw things that didn't work out well. And we need to do better next time, and that's why I'm glad everyone is here, because we need to figure out how to do better the next time. And if we are going to incorporate resilience, into this approach to disaster response recovery. I can't imagine anyone better at the center of that conversation than the people of Puerto Rico who can teach us more about resilience than I think anybody else. Uh, in my work at the department, I focus on energy transitions for island and remote communities. And that's how I met Cecilio and Marla. I've learned just like to like Bill and, and Mark and Trisha have that you can have you can have a convening power that you didn't expect. And I was able to we were able to working together as a community, able to bring together a lot of stakeholders in Puerto Rico in 2013, 14, and 15 to talk through at that time where where Puerto Rico needed to go from an energy transition standpoint. And there were a lot of great conversations that happened at that point. I know that was when Inesi was starting, and I know it kind of matured in that time frame, and some of those, and you all continued some of those conversations, and, and thank you for, for following up on that. It really, when I, when I saw that momentum that you, that you continued to put behind that, those conversations, I was really, really happy. Um, that work gave me the foundation to help with the Maria response and recovery. I was an ESF 12 responder, for those of you that know what that is, uh, but most of my time has been spent on the recovery. And these are some of the, the areas of inquiry that we have the national labs working on from an energy systems perspective in Puerto Rico. I'm happy to talk about these offline. I, there's, we have several days worth of recorded webinars, I believe, and I would be happy to share the link with everyone and give people information to follow up about this more time than we possibly have uh, to cover it all today, but I just want to give you all a sense that we, we are working on this and we are thinking really hard about these questions, and one of them in particular is how to get to 60, 80, 100 percent renewables and, and have the system be uh, stable. When we do all of that analysis work you know, at the national labs, they often want, want to find the optimal solution. So for the department as a whole, half of our budget goes to nuclear weapons and nuclear science, and that's fantastic. The other half is for basic and applied science. To underscore how important that is, I think we, I wouldn't be here and we, uh, if all of those researchers weren't working on R&D and putting out papers, because that's the stuff that I spend my time thinking about, how to get that out into the real world. And when I do th think about that, I realize that optimal, when you're doing a modeling and out, you know, running one model is different from another model. And it's also different from a technological standpoint or economic standpoint. And of course, the social optimal is something that is often elusive, but the, hard, the most important optimal to find. And achieving an optimal outcome, I think like convergence, takes bringing people together. Like this, um, like Inessi, 
continuing to bring people together. But it also takes being honest with each other. It takes being honest about what you can bring to the table, what your strengths are, what your interests are, and, and not really hiding the ball on what you want to see at the end of the day. And that's really hard for a lot of people um, because there's often competing interests. And it might be self-interest, it might be the interest of your institution. Well, my university really should get this funding, not yours. Or the federal government saying, well, we really do this, not you guys. And really just figuring out what the desired outcome is and what everyone can bring to the table and kind of try to leave ego out of it as much as possible. So with that in mind, these are some of the thoughts I have about um, what RISE could do to help bridge that gap and create convergence. You know, I think pedagogy has come up quite a bit and the resilience pedagogy, what does that mean? Is that a unique discipline? Is that something that we need to create a discipline around? Obviously, there was conversations from the very, very beginning of the conference about tenure track and what that means and how that could be adjusted. As related to that publication type and frequency, what counts towards tenure, what counts as academic, what counts as valuable from getting the scientific research out to the public. I think evaluating that needs to happen. And then, of course, something else that's come up quite a bit is resilience core competencies and curriculum. We see some examples of that. Uh, some folks have presented on it, but I think more thinking on that particular topic would definitely be worthwhile. We could create resilient community technical assistance partnerships, and we have some models on programs at DOE that have done work in a similar format. There's a lot that we could do, mutual aid being another one. Uh, these are just some of my thoughts, happy to discuss in the cohort and with everyone afterwards. Um, these are some of the things I think we can, could, should do. One would be published proceedings of this conference. And Bill and I and Wendy talked about that briefly. And I think I also talked about it with Catherine up there. Um, it could be a foundation for a journal of resilience studies, which doesn't exist. I mean, there's a couple journals out there that touch on resilience in a particular context, but maybe not quite as broad as RISE has in mind. Obviously, establishing a mission, vision, and goals is important. One of the low-hanging mangoes might be a federal program for a resilience financing guide. There's a federal financing guide for clean energy that's out there. You can Google it and find it. Um, looking up, doing something like that, but focused on resilience is timely and could be really, really useful, and not that hard. One that is going to be a little bit more hard, more hard, but is also very timely and I think very, very important, I want to emphasize everyone here, is coordination among state-level planning efforts with regard to housing, energy, and disaster mitigation. There are new programs at FEMA. There's a lot of uh, disaster funding at HUD. All of these, those funds will go to different agencies and they can be used for energy, but those state level agencies have to plan what to do with those funds and it's incumbent on those state agencies to do the coordination at the state level. So with your help, you can provide knowledge to the state agencies and, and speak to the governors and speak to those agencies and drive coordination among those planning efforts. Big opportunity, there's a lot of money on the table for the, in the next 12 months. Um, Unfortunately, hopefully the disaster funds dry up because there are no more disasters, but assuming they do continue, that coordination at the state level will be fundamentally important. Uh, and then one thing to, to go back to the very beginning of the very first panel, um, your, some, of, some presidents said, well, the faculty needs to tell me what they want to do. Hold them to that. Uh, uh, Come to agreement with principal, uh, in principle, about uh, changing the curriculum, changing tenure, and then so that the, the faculty know the president has bought in and they're working towards something that can be approved, would be approved at the end of the day, assuming it's a good product. And then obviously the very last next step we have to take is raise our hands and volunteer to do some of this stuff and then start scoping projects and start working together. And that's all. Fantastic. Already hands were raising. I was, you know, feeling a little regret that I missed the first two days. And as I, and I still regret not being with you longer. 
but as I sat and listened to this panel and I came from a, a convergence of the practice community, I noted three big things that are very much in common uh, that I just want to put onto the floor. And then as I promised, I want to open it up to the greater dialogue for you to talk with us a little bit more. Uh, mental health, that is such an important piece that has not been really well addressed by the practice community, by the academic community, by a lot of communities. And there is a lot of motivation and incentive right now for emergency managers. Uh, the IAEM is standing up a new caucus on mental health. You had brought it up uh, just a little bit. And I think that it's important for our communities, for our responders, for our academics who go into the field and come back. How do we care for each other? It really comes down to love and care. These are the strong things. These are the fuel. And that might just be my message, what I keep saying, is that it, that's the fuel that's really going to bring the convergence. The mutual aid uh, among universities that you mentioned, there's a huge caucus in the International Association of Emergency Managers of emergency managers on academic institutions. If you haven't worked with them yet, you haven't connected with them yet, do it. They are connected themselves and uh, they're a powerful force and they want to do more things. So I think that's a great way to converge with the practice. And then the federal agency coordination, your comments really struck me and I was surprised by that being, you know, feds and all. Um, the scope creep, I was thinking, man, one of the things that came up at IAEM is that the federal agency, we need to do a better job of coordinating. The FEMA mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. I don't see much that you've probably talked about that really creeps into that. It's part of our mission. Uh, it's part of our mission to be, you know, to support the emergency support functions, to figure that out. But we have to do it together. So um, I, I like that. It really got me thinking, you know, when I started off the Coalition of Willing, I'm glad it's coming. This effort is coming from academic institutions. And I know there are uh, DHS and FEMA people who have been here and are in the room. And we have a role, too, to be a part of this as a collaborator not as a director per se, but certainly as a collaborator. There are a lot of ways that we can get things done. The financing guide, I think that's great. I would want to be on federal financing. I want to know all the financing and funding that's out there to really, really push the collaboration. So anybody, I mean, have you been doing questions as people stand up and go to the mics or how are we doing this? So if anybody has a question, go to the mic. I have more questions, but this is really about, this is our last day together. This is our day to really do that convergence, to have this conversation with each other. Whether you ad agree, disagree, have something to add, it's the time is now. Go ahead. Hi. Um, it's fun to be on this side of the microphone. I've been on that side of the microphone for a few days. So I want to comment on, um, or really ask a question about the, the fourth bullet, the driving coordination among state level planning efforts. So um, in the research center that I lead, we spend a lot of time uh, at all levels of government um, really working to generate conversations uh, around multi-level planning efforts. And so I was very excited about the idea that uh, you, know, you in a, a position of encouraging, focusing, even compelling uh, federal agencies to drive coordination among the state level uh, agencies. My question is to what extent and in what way might you think about how to encourage or even require um, those state level planning efforts to engage communities, right? We've talked about communities so many times in the communities that I work with, the local governments here in New York State and around the world, uh, the states don't necessarily engage the local communities in planning the kind of coordination that you're talking about, which is coordinating among the state agencies, but taking into account their individual coordination activities with the local level. So how can we, in these kinds of uh, initiatives or funding programs, uh, encourage or potentially compel uh, our state level colleagues uh, to engage in a really systematic and, and robust way um, the communities they serve. So I'll go first and I'm sure others have perspective based on their their experience. Um, right now, I think one of the ways to encourage coordination is that it is a timely conversation to have. I mean, the best time to fix the roof is when it's sunny. 
but we also happen to be in a moment where there, HUD has a lot of disaster recovery funds and FEMA has a, at least one new, major new program with regard to mitigation and preparedness and linking up those different agencies at the state level is something that they often haven't needed to do to get the money. In fact, they don't need to do it to get the money. But because of the volume of funds and the new programs that have been created, state level coordination can be a game changer with regard to how effective those programs are. And so I think one of the ways to encourage state coordination is to drive home how timely the opportunity is. Um, with regard to communities, I mean, it's a somewhat intractable problem, but I mean, it takes hard work and a commitment, right? And I think, you know, and I, I want to let Mark and Bill and Tricia comment on that because I know they've all done th this work as well. I want to hear their insights. Yeah, yeah I think one of the, the things that we have to create as well is uh, a mechanism for that community to be better connected to the, to the state level uh, decision making. It, it usually it's not. It's combative. It's, uh, it's uh, based on what is legally required and it's usually a farce, uh, the participation, we, at least in my experience. Uh, public hearings is like, oh my God, what are you doing? Uh, and so they have to be, I mean, I, I, I dare say I'm not the person equipped to talk about legislation, uh, but definitely there has to be some policy that is uh, uh, revised into, into that participation. And in Puerto Rico, community foundations and groups are immensely powerful in, in the human side, you know, so they can definitely do it. One of the things that you mentioned with the money, and, and I think, I don't know if it's as much a driver or a necessity, is that we have to instill that this money should not be used in things that contribute to climate change or contribute to a lack of resiliency, which is what I see happening in many places in Puerto Rico. So we, the, the state level decision making could be influenced by the, by the federal level who is providing the money into assuring that we're not making the same mistakes and actually lowering whatever our definition of resilience is. But I dare say that RISE and the academia can help establish that. I'm not really sure that that's something the federal government is going to drive or the state lo level government, it, it depends on the state. So I shouldn't say that. But in the current situation of Puerto Rico, which is a, a, a fluid and complicated and, and distraught government, I'm not sure I would trust them to make the right decision in terms of climate change or resilience. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure that I have the answer to the question, but I, I can really underscore the importance. There's such a fog of things happening after a disaster that that, of course, is not the time to answer. It needs to be planning ahead of time in communication, uh, the protocols. But I want to uh, speak to something that uh, Mark said, uh, you know, following uh, Superstorm Sandy, you know, our community had a certain amount of uh, money to distribute to various projects. But there was sometimes such a focus from outside on the engineering solutions that I talked about, the seawalls, for example, that I think in the long run could do more harm than good, but people are so desperate for an immediate solution, sorting out the immediate needs from the best for the long range needs, but during the disaster is not the time to talk about that. The, the long range plan, the disaster has to be the trigger for putting protocols for communication and coordination and long-range planning in place long before that happens or, it's, or we're just going to end up with another fog in the next disaster that's just as confusing as the last one was. Great, thanks. I want to just make one maybe a different perspective, and that is that there are states where people are working well together, and so really looking at the exemplars where things are happening, where we are working together is really important as well, see how it's working. And then also empathy. I think sometimes we automatically can say, this person's doing this, or this is self-interested, or this is that, without really taking the time to hear that other person's story. And even people working in state government and federal government government have stories and so getting it back to that human piece I think is also important that we consider not in a Pollyanna sort of way no. but just in a I think that one of the things we heard about about rice is that and, and I see from the the, the participants there that it could be a trusted voice 
In the case of Puerto Rico, our relationship between the federal, I'm going to talk Vieques now, federal, state, and municipal level has so many uh, speed bumps to be nice, you know, and, and not swear or anything. Uh, but uh, that, that there could be a parallel channel that RICE uh, fills in the gap with the community groups to drive some of these initiatives and to make sure that it's a straight path and not to have all these chunks of money or package programs hit a speed bump and never make it. Thank you. We have a question in the back and then I'll come to you who's been standing. Yes, uh, thank you. Excellent panel. Uh, oh, wait, uh, some of you have been speaking, I think um, Martin spoke about the diaspora, the role of the diaspora. And uh, throughout some of the panels that uh, the diasporas have been mentioned, uh, in Puerto Rico in particular, uh, as Martin mentioned, uh, it was a very, very important component in, try in the recovery of Puerto Rico. Uh, is there any university uh, uh, researching or studying uh, how the diasporas behave, uh, how uh, procedures and protocols can be developed so that that assistance could be better channeled. And um, I would like to hear from the panel if there's something uh, being done or could be done regarding that specific uh, uh, f factor uh, that, it, that is very important, uh, at least not only in Puerto Rico, but the rest of the Caribbean. Thank you. Any of the panelists aware of research? I, the only research that I'm aware of is more looking at the the more likelihood of, of, of assistance coming from areas that have a high level of diaspora. Um, I would actually refer us to Jennifer Santos Hernandez who might know a little bit more about the topic um, and the research that has been done in the area because it does intersect with some of the, the work that she's done. <laughs> so, see Jen. Jennifer, could you use a mic, please? Thank you. Yeah, there are a few uh, initiatives that are specifically looking at the role of organizations, so I would be happy to uh, talk with him. Um, but one of the greatest challenges was precisely tied to your work, Tricia, uh, around the supply chain and logistics of what was needed uh, and, and the mismatch with the kind of products that were arriving to the island in the aftermath. So there's certainly a need uh, to work out uh, the relationship with the diaspora so that the resources that are received in the island are more aligned with the needs and not end up disrupting the supply chain. So uh, one of you know, the things that I mentioned yesterday in my presentation is the need to really look at the literature that it's already there, looking at all these uh, specific challenges that are not unique uh, to the situation of Puerto Rico, but that happen in every disaster. And, and I would just add also, I think you're looking at the, the out-migration, um, where people are going to pockets, where there's a, a high diaspora elsewhere, I think a lot of times our focus is on the impacted area, and um, it's sometimes difficult to, to recognize that there is an outflow uh, where we're looking at Puerto Rico or if we look back at the Haiti earthquake of people going to family members, friends for extended time periods. We saw that after Hurricane Katrina even within the mainland um, and how to provide adequate assistance to those people who are impacted by disaster but may not actually be in the physical location where that event happened. Yeah, but I do think that what the gentleman said is it is uh, underrated effort that the diaspora has done. And it also, when you look at the diaspora, people may think of a specific group that has diaspora in the name or in its mission, but in reality, in many levels of government and groups, the diaspora has stood up and has reconnected the diaspora to Puerto Rico in ways that I've never seen before. Uh, and not only in philanthropy and logistics, but also in advocacy. And with the reality... <laughs> and with the reality of the growing Latino market in the United States, that is something that is going to translate into politics big time. And I believe it's an opportunity as well with the funding to create some realistic uh, goals of how this support system can be nurtured. Just one quick comment. Um, we've seen Diaspora help other places around the U.S. as well. Uh, Katrina. But Detroit is one, and every year they have a homecoming 
where folks who have either roots in or strong connections to Detroit from around the country go back and talk about pressing issues for the city and how they can help make drive change and make and revitalize the city. And that sort of soft power coming together to talk about issues is, is it's hard to sometimes trace the influence that it has, but it's definitely influential. And I, I don't, you know, I think there's some of the progress in the city is due to that, that homecoming and that diaspora coming back and still caring and paying attention to, to Detroit. Thank you. Hi. This has been a fantastic conference. Thank you, everybody. Um, one of the things that helps dispel the fog and promotes uh, conversation and collaboration is having a common vocabulary. So my question, I've been working with taxonomies and ontologies. And my question is, since I'm new to this field, is who in this field is developing that common vocabulary that we can use in the academic community so that we don't have Journal X saying the same thing as Journal Y, but using slightly different words. And that we can have that um, trickle down effect from the people who are linguistic and, and interested in this question down to the, the field where the rubber meets the road and we're actually delivering services to disaster victims and the, the non-impacted community is helping. Um, would developing a taxonomy and a, an ontology for disasters, pre-disaster, uh, immediate response and long-term recovery be a, a function that RISE could do? I would say no. Um, and I'm, I'm going to go on the other side of this because I think that there has actually been uh, initially a lot of effort, even in sociology, looking at defining what is a disaster, volumes on it, and even within a discipline not being able to come up with a consistent term that's used. And those conceptions evolve over time. I would be worried that by focusing so much on um, what I mean by resilience or what you mean by resilience or what the next person means by resilience, our attention is better spent um, articulating that from the beginning to have an appreciation that if we're now talking about convergence in terms of um, uh, the, the practice and the, the, the different fields and the sectors, if I speak to convergence to my civil engineering colleagues in supply chain management, they're going to give you a very different, different definition of convergence and say, why are we using this term in this way? If I think about convergence in the social science literature, I think about the work of Charles Fritz back in you know, the, the 1950s and how the idea of convergence of people, material, and information to disaster zones is so well established and then now we're talking about convergence in a totally different sphere. So I, I would be worried, I think there's a, an importance in, in understanding what our colleagues mean by certain terms and having an appreciation of that. Absolutely, I think where we can have some level of understanding and articulation about how we're using those terms is critical. Um, but I also worry that if we spend so much of our time trying to define what we mean by community, and that becomes the focus, and I've been in sessions where it's all about how are you using community? Let's just get over that and talk about the important issues as people's lives are at stake. And we have the knowledge to kind of bring to bear to make change. Let's define what we're meaning about that term now and move on to the really key important issues. So I think that there's a, what you say is important, um, but I think that there's a danger of moving too far in that direction and losing sight of the, the really key things that need to be addressed. I would say that one, one possibility of it is to, as we redefine what the RISE mission is or what the new paradigms are going to be, you could specify what kind of resilience you're talking about by not, re, not defining it differently, but adding a, an adjective to it that is specific to what we're talking about. I think those got to be developed as we develop new ways of working, and I'm, I don't pretend to do it. I think I leave that to, to Cecilia, Marla, and all you guys. Uh, but I want to take a second to commend your, your, your next steps and what to do. I think that, that right now we could cut and paste that, and, and that would be a great uh, way to go. And I think that mutual aid and all those things that you said are, are right on the money. 
Yeah, I would just like to say, I think uh, those taxonomy and ontology of words can be beneficial when we use keywords, when we are looking to share our research, and I think from a faculty and student perspective, we still need to think about that, not that it needs to be so poignant in the definition, but at least so that we can uh, share and disseminate the information. We are running out of time. If we, I know there are two people that want to uh, ask questions, so if we can be quick and try yes. to get um, hi, everybody. My name is Paulina. I am an undergrad student at SUNY ESF. And so my generation is going to be the one that experiences climate change the worst, um, which is scary. But we are eager to do something about it now and continue doing something about, about it in the future. And my question is, what advice do you have for young leaders and young children who will become the new leaders uh, in addressing these wicked problems because a lot of the times it's overwhelming and I see my peers at ESF, sometimes we get depressed, we get sad because it's just too many bad news. So how should we go about being effective and at the same time, like taking care of ourselves while we're at it? Thank you. Yeah, I guess if, if, if I understand your question correctly, and I'm going to go back to, to what I was talking about before, the need for interdisciplinary work has to be grounded in strong disciplinary work. And so I would urge anyone getting started into this to pick a discipline and become an expert and a, and a knowledge expert in your field at the same time looking for ways to develop those interdisciplinary and, and cross-disciplinary uh, uh, connections. I think it was last night someone was talking uh, about don't tear down the silos, build bridges and tunnels <laughs> and uh, connections between the silos. But I, but I think for, for a young person starting, I would urge the importance of, of, of grounding in, in, in a specific discipline. And I would have a little bit of an opposite of, of, of guidance. And I think that's important as, a, as an undergraduate student for you to recognize that there's no right or wrong answer. And it's not like you have these wide sa wise sages here to give you some sort of guidance. It's, it's finding messages that resonate and guidance that resonates with what you want to do. Uh, I mean, we have uh, wonderful students who are pursuing that kind of depth that is absolutely key to understanding the issue. And we have other students who are pursuing interdisciplinary degrees that are boundary spanners who do not have that depth and recognize they don't have it, um, but they're functioning in a different way. And whether you're pursuing scholarly research or whether you're pursuing more of an applied field, um, one of the things that I scribble on like a post-it note in my office is march to a louder drum. And I don't really know what that, that means in terms of direct, but it keeps me going that there are going to be challenges, you are going to be stressed, you are going to be frustrated, work is going to be hard, and finding those connections that are valuable to you, where you find meaning in your work, that you can get through those hard spots, and if that's hard spots in terms of of, of your academic program or the relationships that you have or working with community saying this is important and this is worth my time, this is worth my energy and I'm going to keep at it. I think maybe maybe that will help. Yeah, I think one of the things, you personally you can vote and buy and learn well and, and make a difference that way but I think as you go in your academic career uh, you should take action and, and by acting, you, it, you know, it'll help not, that helplessness that you feel is what you're going to be feeling it, it, it will be uh, counteracted. Mindful that the reality is that your generation is going to receive a different level of mental health problems uh, from climate change because you're, we're facing it in like, hey, we're going to die, you know, like, but uh, <laughs> no, but, but, but it is a different and it's a new and that, that should ride the wave of the constant awareness that is changing daily about climate change into, again, bold, radical change that needs to happen. We have the last question, and then. Oh, can we do two more questions? Okay, I'm just keeping my eye on the hook. <laughs> you, you can go ahead. Hi, I'm Kim Connolly. I'm from SUNY's only law school in Buffalo, um, and I love this panel. I've loved the whole couple of days. I'd like to make a friendly amendment to number one on the list that's no longer up there. 
I'd like to say not just proceedings. I'd like to say let's make a converged panoply of a lot of materials. So let's make the academic stuff that we need, I mean, I have tenure, that we need for that world that gives it gravitas. Let's make things that will help people on the ground. Let's make learning materials that will help the students. Let's come from here with a number of people who are excited to do that. Is that something that, that you think would be interesting, is my question. If, you, if we can come up with ways, and let's make things that are in Spanish, that we can share. Let's, let's create a framework that's going to give us a, a, a building blocks to be bigger and broader and, and kind of go forward with a lot of them from a lot of different people in this room. Incredibly important. And I think the idea that they have brought up, the idea they brought out of creating a search engine that would uh, bring together all the available tools with prompts of how to use it to your community. For somebody like me, if I would have had that, life saved, you know, thousands of dollars saved, and a connection not only to the digital world, but to the participant of RICE that are actually studying or providing, I think that would be incredibly valuable as well as some of the other possibilities that may come from it. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm with FEMA and I work in, my name is Olivia, and I work in long-term recovery. And one of the things that we've experimented with, with Hurricane Michael DR4399, um, through this role called an academia advisor, is linking, linking impacted communities with uh, university technical assistance um, on community-driven long-term recovery plans and projects. Um, we have run the gamut in, uh, in Hurricane Michael and working with communities on stormwater management uh, projects and studies on mental health, behavioral health, particularly among school-age youth who have been impacted uh, by the hurricane displaced, as well as aging populations, as well as building resiliency centers um, to provide sheltering um, for underserved and marginalized communities, um, ha having a dual purpose um, in blue skies, as well as uh, serving as a shelter in times of disaster. Um, one of the ways, um, I guess, that we've approached this is integrating it with existing um, curricular offerings, um, making it, in, in, integrating it with existing faculty research, integrating it with existing curricular and co-curricular structures within universities. In that way, it's not separate. Faculty are not seeing it as something, an, an add-on to an already packed curriculum but it's something that gives the students a real world examples. And I, and I should um, also add that these projects are faculty mentored, um, but done by student teams working under the mentorship of faculty. Um, and again, um, doing it in such a way that is not something additional, but also gives the students um, something that they can latch on to a real world issue um, and, and framing it within uh, the area of social justice. Um, which students seem to, to gravitate towards. So I'm wondering as we move forward and look at more sort of sustainable and, and, and one of the, the proposed outcomes of, of this work that we've been doing is to develop sustainable relations between those communities and the universities. Because long after FEMA is gone, those universities like Florida A&M that have been you know, in Tallahassee since the 1870s continue to work with the communities. I'm wondering, you know, from your vantage point, um, do you have any observations about how to perhaps uh, expand this in a larger way? Um, within a variety of disciplines, within a, a variety of geographical and organizational contexts, whether you're a big university, a smaller college, and I'd like to point out that we, we really do need to give a space to, to smaller colleges as well as large research universities. Um, but I'd like to sort of get your insights on, on that. Sure, I guess let, let, let me re respond to that uh, from my perspective. I think all of the things that you mentioned are, are, are are right on uh, between what needs to happen. I think what helped us at the College of Staten Island was developing a strategic plan that talked about boroughs, because we are on the borough of uh, Staten Island, we called it borough stewardship, 
and sort of a, a feeling that we were a part of the community, not apart from the community. And having that guiding mission statement to get that strategic plan in place, we had to have faculty buy-in, we had to have student buy-in, we had to have community buy-in before the plan. And, and that really has helped in terms as, as faculty are going out and looking for what they do in their courses. You know, there's really a theme in what many of our courses for serving community needs and working with the community um, because that's where our students are from. We're, we're really all working to advance the same. And I think you have to embed that in the strategic framework of the institution for it to, to really work. Really short, creating or identifying local convergence hubs. That is one of the missing pieces that I see when all these projects come, they don't have a local participation, the logistics, the connection breaks down. And just to add quickly, it sounds like a great example of things that we need to do more of. And to tie it to the question before, I think there's, all, there's so much that we can learn from each other just in this room. So many building blocks that we need to just pay attention to how we're arranging them so that we can do better the next time. There's so much stuff that's already out there. We need to understand better what the current landscape is and then build on that so we can do better next time. Great. Thank you. I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for their speaking points. And I want to thank all of you who asked questions and who are noodling around what has been said. We really wanted to talk about the convergence. We wanted to talk about the impact on climate change, on the gaps, the incentives, where what frameworks might be possible, uh, technical solutions. Most importantly, we want to talk about implementation and next steps. And I think that's where we are. So again, I want to thank all the panel with a round of applause for being with us today.